All right, let's turn together to Luke 12, if you have a copy of the Bible. Luke 12, if you're uh, relatively new to the scriptures, uh, if you can find the New Testament, it's a good orienting point, and then flip to the third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, will be in chapter 12. If we were talking to my little kiddos, I would say little number 49. So big number 12, little number 49. Luke 12, uh, beginning in verse 49, we'll read to the end of the chapter. And uh, as you're turning there, I want you to imagine with me a guy named Jeff. And Jeff is not an actual person. In fact, he's probably more of a personality type, but I think it helps our minds to put a face to a person, to, to a type uh, of person. So I want you to imagine Jeff. Jeff's raised in the South by Christian parents, and he's long familiar with the rhythms of Christianity. His youth, he consistently attends a Methodist church that his family has attended for generations. He knows and hears in this context the central claims of Christianity, and he finds the sermons helpful and clear and, and good. He, along the span of his youth, uh, comes to agree with many of the moral tenets of Christianity and finds that he organizes his life according to Jesus' example in many ways. But Jeff never repents of his sins. He never publicly professes faith in Jesus. He's never baptized. He never joins a local church. Now as an adult, Jeff is still exposed to the church. He met and marries a woman who, according to him, really takes all this stuff seriously. He appeases her by continuing to come to church. He'll even publicly pray at some big events along the way and volunteers at things like their church's version of grassroots. By all accounts, Jeff is a good man. He's faithful to his wife. He's kept a clean record in his business dealings. He's worked hard. He's saved for retirement, and he's raised respectable kids. He's even outspoken on many of the hot-button issues that are in keeping with the religious tenets of the day. And his political voting record shows him to be in line with his religious friends. Shortly before his 62nd birthday, with no previous health issues to speak of, Jeff suffers a massive heart attack and dies in his bedroom. What is Jeff's fate? This is what we would call in the business a squirmy question. It makes all of us feel icky because the answer that we give to this question makes sense of much of what we're doing this morning, and it causes us to filter many family members, friends, those that we love deeply that are our version of Jeff. In many ways, the answer that you give to Jeff's fate defines your understanding of what we're doing here this morning. If, on the one hand, God looks over the sum total of Jeff's life and, in the final analysis, ushers him into paradise where he experiences eternal, uninterrupted joy, worshiping God and serving in a renewed world, then if we're honest, this is a big waste of time. We're simply ticking a few boxes in the good column. We'd want to tip the scales in our favor with perfunctory church attendance, but there'd be no need for wholehearted engagement. There'd be no need for repentance and faith. There'd certainly be no need for teary-eyed singing. If you're merely wanting the balance of your life to fall into the good column and bank your eternity on the I hope, then this falls flat. But if Jeff stands eternally condemned, because while he may have given a fair moral accounting for his life, he did not do the very thing that God requires. He did not repent of his sins. He did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then we've got another issue altogether. The truths that we're singing about and praying about and talking about really matter. In fact, Jeff is the invisible character that gives color to Luke 12, verses 49 to 59. He gives us a sense of why these verses matter. Let me read it in its entirety. 
This is Jesus speaking. These are almost all red letter words in your copy of the scriptures, perhaps. I came to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it's finished. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three, they'll be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say a storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret the present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hands you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. In a church like ours, with multiple people preaching on a regular basis, there's a little bit of intramural competition that develops among the pastors. Hopefully the intramural competition isn't who can preach a better sermon, but a bit of friendly fire from one preacher to the next. So last week, Pastor Brandon led us to reflect on the previous passage in Luke's gospel under the title, Gas Station Ready, which if I understand correctly, it means I should be on guard at 2.30 a.m. when I'm paying $4.50 for a gallon of gas for the perpetrator that might attack me. So, Right, Brandon? That's what I should be doing. I fear, however, that I am not one who is gas station ready. Those little TV monitors catch me up on all the entertainment fads of our day, and they're incredibly distracting. But in an effort to keep up with the cadence of backwoodsmanship, I've titled this week's sermon, Mowing Dirt, An Eternal Perspective on the Here and Now. While speculating, I'd imagine that over the course of our lives, about two of my hearers this morning are going to have a reason to actually be gas station ready. Maybe you meet an assailant at the local gas station and you have to fight for your life. But my guess is 90% of us have done this. You've mowed some dirt in your life. Maybe you live in a manicured paradise now, but you remember a time when your yard looked more like the local elementary school softball field where the dirt to grass ratio was something like 10 to 1. And you're trying to determine how in the world am I going to address these weed slash grass slivers that are appearing in this dirt paradise. I could buy a goat, I could clip the sprigs with scissors, or I could spend the next two hours creating a dust storm fit for the Sahara. It's a ton of effort, a ton of exposure, a ton of coughing and hacking, that results in little more than a marginally less ugly yard than you had before. Try as you might, you're merely snipping the top of the weeds and a little grass until two weeks from now you're going to have to do the whole thing over again, which is one reason you have kids. You make them do it and you sit and laugh at them, all right? This practice, this image, is the life Jesus is warning us against in all of Luke 12 and Luke 13, a section that deals almost exclusively with life after death. If you remember back where we started this portion of of teaching in Luke's Gospels, Luke 9, uh, verse 51, and we made the point there that there's a shift in Luke's writing where Jesus turns his face, sets his attention towards Jerusalem, and all that happens from Luke 9, 51 to Luke 19 is on the path to Jerusalem where Jesus knows that he's going to suffer his fate, uh, he's going to give his life as a ransom. Full attention is on the cross. He knows that Jerusalem awaits. And he spent years with these followers, so he's beginning to turn up the intensity of his challenge to them, knowing that they're going to soon face the ultimate test of allegiance. He's going to be gone. His followers are going to be heavily persecuted, and they're going to have to decide, often at cost of their lives, if what Jesus has said is real, or is this whole thing a sham? 
So using Luke's framing of these teachings from Jesus in verses 49 to 59, I want to this morning make three claims about life in this world in light of eternity. Three claims. Along the way, I'm going to attempt to root each of these claims in one of the subsections of Scripture that we just read, which if you notice, is really broken up into three sections. We're not sure if Jesus was teaching all of this at the same time and same place, or if Luke packages this to make the same point. But we're going to make three central claims from the text. And then at the end, I'm going to provide three parting thoughts of specific application for us here at Christ Fellowship. So number one, first claim. It is possible to fixate on matters of temporary importance and completely lose sight of matters of eternal significance. It is possible to fixate on matters of temporary importance and completely lose sight of matters of eternal significance. Let me validate that claim looking in verses 54 to 56. Now, why start with verses 54 to 56 when the passage actually this morning began back in verse 49? It seems to me, as I'm reading this text, that the question posed in verse 56 is really the framing question on both what precedes and what follows it. You might think of this like the central stud in a wall, that once it's established, you then organize what's to the right and left on the basis of this. So Jesus asked, hey, guys, you don't know how to interpret the present time. You're missing something. You're misunderstanding life in the here and now. And he poses this question with a a bit of a punch. It's a punch that falls a bit flat for us, but it certainly would have had significance in the ancient Near East. Look in verse 54 and 55. What What does he point to? He points to weather patterns. People in the ancient world would have gotten really good at predicting the weather. This Uh, In contrast, even to our society, it's a super big deal in an agrarian society. What happens with the weather is going to inform much of your plans for travel, much of what you can do, when you should harvest, so on and so forth. And they don't look at apps or newscasters like we do. do They They, they look to the sky. They see the appearance of clouds, the color of the night sky, the direction of the wind, and they know with a fairly high degree of certainty what's getting ready to come. And then more than that, and this is the critical point here, on the basis of that knowledge then, they make decisions about what they're going to do the next day or the next week or the next month. We see something, we observe it, we predict something, and then we base our lives in accordance with that which we have observed. You follow this pattern on a micro scale with your life. Most of you check your weather app or whatever tool you use, particularly this time of year, to determine your plans for the next day and or you ask your wife or husband who checks their app, like, what's it going to be like tomorrow? And on the basis of that, if it's going to be a cool, crisp morning, if it's going to rain, if it's going to be sweltering by lunch, you dress accordingly, right? Jesus laments, though, that people have gotten really good on predicting weather patterns but they've lost sight of the patterns of eternal significance, specifically what Jesus is claiming is going to happen with his life, death, burial, resurrection. They've missed out. So there are some big problems with simply predicting the weather. First, it's not a huge deal what the weather is the next day. I mentioned that it's a bigger deal in an agrarian society, but certainly for us, it might make you uh, feel a bit icky, you might get a bit wet, might make you uncomfortable, but in the big scheme of things, a daily weather event is about as insignificant an illustration as possible. Secondly, we're not certain that these weather predictions are actually going to come to pass. We know this to be true in our day. In fact, we mock it, right? It's often the the opposite, a big storm, a winter weather event, the placement of a tornado. Even modern experts aren't all that accurate about specific details. And thirdly, and this is Jesus' point, it's not nearly as important as understanding eternal realities. Even if you get it right, 
And even if it does matter, there's something that matters more. And if you hyper-focus on the thing that kind of matters, you lose sight of the thing that really matters. Even if you get it right, there's something bigger like the coming judgment of God and our eternal fate at stake, such that even the most awe-inspiring weather pattern should barely catch your notice. We'll return to this with application at the end. Big idea number two. It is possible to allow temporary relationships to distract or discourage us from eternal fellowship. It is possible to allow temporary relationships to distract or discourage us from eternal fellowship. And we might add there, fellowship with God. Look back at verse 49, just because it's been a moment since I've read this, I'll reread it, beginning in verse 49. I came to bring fire on the earth. How I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it's finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. And then he goes on to list the human relationships that will be divided. Now remember, what we've just established is the central stud that informs what's coming before and what's coming after. So on the basis of that central stud, you need to be thinking about eternity. Don't hyper-focus on trivial matters such that you lose sight of something that's more significant. Now, if your perspective is on something more significant, how does that press you back down here? And Jesus' words aren't all that encouraging. He says one of the ways that's going to press you back down here is in the form of human division. Jesus' focus here is drawing his listeners not necessarily to the end times when he will return, but to the coming day specifically when he will be crucified. Look in verse 50. He uses the language of baptism here, speaking of what he is getting ready to undergo. This language of baptism isn't second coming language, but it's specifically uh, about his coming death. We're going to see this used time and time again as a, a picture, baptism as a picture of Jesus' death. In Mark 10, Jesus says to them, uh, these followers who are jockeying for position, can we sit at your right hand or your left? He says, you don't know what you're doing. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? What's he speaking of there? He's speaking of his coming death. And then he warns them, you don't know it yet, but you're actually going to suffer a very similar fate. When we baptize, we speak of someone being buried like Christ as they're submerged under the water. The fact is even more substantiated by the language that Jesus uses in verse 50. Look back there. He says, I am consumed with this work until, what's the phrase he uses there? Until it is finished. If you're familiar with the story of the Gospels and where we're heading Uh, soon in Jesus' life, you know that that idea, it is finished, is very significant for us. It finds its way to Jesus' lips right before his death. It foreshadows Jesus' declaration before his death that the work is finished, or in John 17, Jesus' famous high priestly prayer, I've glorified you on this earth having done all the work that you gave me to do. So when Jesus speaks of his baptism, he's speaking of his coming death when it will be finished. And he says, I long to finish this work, which is quite a claim knowing that he knows what is coming. This is significant. But then how do we interpret verse 49? So again, look back in your, in your text. I've intentionally chosen not to put the words on the screen this morning. I'm just trying something out. But I really want to press your nose in your Bible um, so that you're not kind of hyper-focused up here, but you're looking in the scriptures uh, to see these points. So in verse 49, um, he says, I long for this to happen. Uh, I came to bring fire on earth. How I wish it were already set ablaze. How do we interpret Jesus' claim there? The first way we interpret it is probably the most commonsensical upon first read. 
Jesus longs to bring fire on the earth in a way of purging it from sin, a way of purifying it. Like the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah in the past, or the judgment that Peter uses in 2 Peter 3.10. Language of fire that's going to come to the earth to cleanse, to remove impurity, to judge wickedness and sin. And the language of fire is a common way that Jesus speaks of the judgment of the wicked who will suffer eternal judgment or punishment where the fire will not be quenched. Where the fire will not be quenched. But another suggestion from commentators, and I actually find this more compelling, is that fire should be more closely connected with Jesus' earthly work and his coming death because of the link to death that we've already been describing. Those who hold this view suggest that the fire that he longs for is the fire that's going to come in Acts 2 at Pentecost, when he'll send fire on the earth as a way of symbolically gathering his people. His fire will fall at Pentecost, pouring out his Holy Spirit and gathering his church. Now, both interpretations actually lead to a similar conclusion. Jesus is both Saving, longing to save his people and judge the wicked. He longs for that work to be finished. And he knows that the path to these outcomes is through his coming death. So he says, I, I long for that time to come. And in light of this coming reality, he gives a clear word of challenge. Association with me is going to separate you from the world. It's going to separate you even from the closest human relationships on this earth. Allegiance to Jesus is going to transcend, supersede human bonds of allegiance. The eternal division between the sheep and the goats, between the righteous and the wicked, is going to be manifest on this earth among those whom God saves. They will be divided. Now, there are certain passages of the Bible that have greater or lesser resonance depending on the culture in which those passages are read. For many of us who are listening this morning, this call feels forceful, but if we're honest, it falls flat. I would guess very few of my hearers this morning have had to, by virtue of their allegiance to Christ, separate from their fundamental human relationships on this earth. Very few of you in your baptismal act were disfellowshipped from your biological family by virtue of that choice. But for many around the world, this is exactly what happens. This text is common sense. It jumps off the page. Well, of course, to align with Jesus means I disassociate with my family, with my culture, with my hope for the future. This is a significant claim. And Jesus' call here is both instructive and encouraging for this group. It's instructive because it reminds Jesus' followers of the necessity of choice. And it's encouraging because it reminds them that their choice is worth it. The necessity of a choice, we're going to return to this in just a moment, and that that choice is worth it. Third main claim from our passage this morning. It is possible for temporary indecision to result in eternal judgment. It is possible for temporary indecision to result in eternal judgment. Verse 57, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going to your adversary, to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you've paid your last penny. The picture in verses 57 to 59 is someone who is rightly guilty. The criminal who knows that he or she will be judged. And Jesus warns that such a one should work really hard to settle the case out of court. 
Because if it goes before the judge, you don't want to stand and argue before the judge on that day. In our court system, we see this play out all the time, sometimes much to our consternation, right? My crack team of researchers, meaning my fingers at Google uh, a couple of days ago, uh, did some scholarly digging and found that 90% of criminal cases in the U.S. end in out-of-court settlement. 97% of federal cases, 94% of state cases. Few people want to entrust their fate to a jury and a judge. Now we know in our case there are all sorts of fancy law tricks that make this the reality. Lesser punishments, promises of ease of sentencing, and the like. It's not always on the up and up why a case would end early. In Jesus' example, however, the purpose isn't to identify all the people who are playing out in the scenario. One person, the bailiff, isn't a stand-in for Jesus and another for God the Father or anything like that. The point's simple. If you're walking along in life and you know you're under condemnation for sin, then you should make a decision to do something about it now rather than waiting to the judge in eternity. You should settle the case now, particularly if you're given a just mechanism for settling that case rather than awaiting the fate that will come at the hands of the judge in all eternity. What's even more astounding about this passage is Jesus knows his actions are going to provide a means by which the just payment for our verdict could be placed on Christ. This isn't a plea deal without justice. This isn't a just judge. This is, it, it's a just judge determining a path where a just payment for sin could be accounted to a substitute. The it is finished that Jesus longs for in the opening stanza finds fulfillment in the one who will make it possible for our sin, the just payment for our sin, to be accounted for. And so knowing this outcome, Jesus invites people, trust me in this life. Don't wait until it's too late, until you stand before the judge, because Jesus knows they will stand condemned before the just judge on the final day. Now quickly, before we're done, three specific points of application that are derived, in my estimation, from the three main ideas we've just seen. And don't worry, my comments here are going to be far more brief than my three opening remarks. Application point number one. We must not let our God-centered understanding of salvation cause us to avoid imploring people to repent and believe. We must not let our God-centered understanding of salvation cause us to avoid, cop out, to avoid imploring people to repent and believe. A bit of commentary. You, like me, might look back on some of the experiences of your past in regards to altar calls and invitations with a bit of exasperation. Raise your hand. Pray a prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm waiting at the front for just one more to walk the aisle. You might look at those as a bit old-fashioned. Perhaps even some would go so far as to suggest a bit manipulative in their approach. Some may even look back over the songs that we would sing in moments like that. Songs like, I have decided to follow Jesus. Verse 9. And we would say, well, maybe the lyrics of that song overemphasize the role of our decision in salvation at the expense of God's sovereignty in granting salvation. Coupled together, I have decided to follow Jesus with a 14-minute invitation, with a pastor begging just one more to walk forward, and perhaps we have legitimate pause. And I don't want to make light of these legitimate and troublesome realities, but I do want to avoid, I want to warn us to avoid veering into the other ditch simply because we see ourselves drifting into the other. 
There is simply no getting around the fact that there is human responsibility to repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. And this decision, this act, comes with a decision on your part. Under the hood, yes, there are all sorts of divine operations at work that are making this decision available and possible, yet the necessity of decision is still imperative. No one meanders their way into becoming a Christian. The process might seem meandering that gets you there, but there is for all legitimate Christians a divine call to a decision on our part to repent of our sins, believe the truth about Jesus, and place our faith in his finished work. That's what this table will invite us to in a minute. It is for those who have made a decision to place their faith in Jesus. And yes and amen, we will have core classes about all the unique under-the-hood realities that are defining that. And we want to have a big God orientation to his sovereignty and salvation. Yes and amen. But you have a responsibility to repent and believe the good news of Jesus. And so does your family. So do your friends. So does your son and daughter. You don't meander, you don't jeff your way to heaven. You decide. Secondly, we must live with an ever-present urgency. We must live with an ever-present urgency. I mentioned it already, but I want you to think back to Jeff, my opening illustration. If Jeff becomes my neighbor, and I assume the moral scale equation to eternity, then my effort to share the gospel with him uh, is likely going to amount to the type of urgency that I have of rousing my kids from sleep on a Saturday morning. I mean, I'm fine if they get up, perhaps, but frankly, there's no harm in them sleeping till lunch. Might make life easier for me. So I might flip on their lights, but eh, at the end of the day, no big deal. So too with Jeff. Perhaps if his marriage unravels, Maybe if he faces a terminal diagnosis, then I reach out to him and I up my game when it comes to talking about Jesus. But so long as his life seems to be moving along fine, why not just let him keep moving? If, however, what Jesus teaches in this passage is true, then Jeff is living each day with a judgment notice affixed to his life. He doesn't know the day or time when the just judge will call, but when he does, Jeff will stand condemned. Such a reality changes my approach from rousing my kids from Saturday slumbers to inviting my girlfriend to be my wife. I'm joyfully, passionately, actively inviting her to a decision that will shape the rest of her life. And you best believe, friends, that, dis- that ask is not out of sight, out of mind for anyone that's purchased a ring and waiting for the ask. It's compelling. Now I get, and, and I don't want to belittle, I know urgency takes many forms. Many of you have talked to a parent or a sibling or a dearly loved friend about the gospel for many years, and often the tendency is to grow cold, assuming they've heard the gospel, they know where to find answers if they have questions down the road, I've done my part, I don't want to manipulate My kid's asking questions. I don't want to talk them into being baptized. I get all of that. And at times, there's wisdom in that approach. You'd certainly not be wise to be the person that's bringing up eternal damnation over every Easter ham. However, do those that you love know the critical reality of their coming judgment? Do they feel the weight of that? Do they know that you fear for them because they've not repented of their sins and believed in the gospel? Or are they under the assumption that you believe things will work out in the end? I know that's a more palatable notion, especially in our modern world, but it just doesn't square with the teaching of Scripture. Jeff is not okay in the end. And neither is your friends, your neighbors, your kids. Thirdly, lastly, and I'm done. 
We must actively and intentionally make daily decisions about what's important on the basis of what's important. We must actively and intentionally make daily decisions about what's important on the basis of what's important. Now I know you're like, Matt, you typo that slide. In fact, my autofill this week um, wanted me to add in to me at the end of this statement on the basis of what's important to me. But actually, that's the exact point that I'm trying not to make. I want to make the point that there is an objective standard of what's important. There is actually something that's important. And that, this sounds harsh, but that doesn't really care what you think about it. It just is. There's an eternal reality before a just judge that is important. It's not up for us to decide. What's important is that God is worshipped by his people who repent of their sins and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is objectively what's important. It's not to imply that other things don't matter. There are ball games to get to, relationships to care for, meals to cook, children to raise, jobs to work. None of these things are inherently bad, nor should they be seen as such. But, friends, it is possible for these things of lesser importance to so dominate our focus, our fears, our sacrifices, our decisions, that we simply make little time to orient ourselves to what's actually important. We can spend a lot of time mowing dirt. And what makes this hard is there's no universal rules to apply for this. So I've just got to trust the Spirit's work in your hearts, those of you who have repented and trusted in Christ, to press this and bring conviction where it's appropriate. Because a person might be busy, and you say, "Uh, out of bounds, that person's wasting their time mowing dirt. But maybe that person's actually using their busyness to be super intentional about pouring their lives out on behalf of others. Maybe they're sharing the gospel, showing hospitality, living on mission. So their busyness is purposeful, Whereas another person with the same scorecard of busyness might be using those hours to invest in far more temporal activities. Or a person might advance in their career and make high wages. And you say, there you go, somebody that's just mowing dirt. Yet behind the scenes, that person is giving away thousands of dollars to the work of mission. They're leveraging their resources to build up the local church. Whereas another person who's actually making far less, might be far more concerned with worldly trinkets. Only you know if you're mowing dirt. And it is an appropriate press for us. We must consider, how do I orient my life to not hyper-focus on weather that may come, but to focus on the eternal God who will come. And that's a good way to leave us this morning. Before we come to the Lord's table, I'm going to invite the servers to go ahead and come and distribute the elements. I'll invite Walker to come and uh, begin to play some music for us. We're going to take a few moments as those elements are distributed for you to prayerfully reflect. I hope this morning's sermon is giving you something to reflect on, to consider your life the orientation of it as to what is important. If you're here and you're not a believer, you've not made a decision to follow Jesus, an easy ask for you would be just to pass on the elements as they're being distributed. And in the back of the auditorium, there are going to be people who would love to talk to you. We'd love to help you process how you might make a decision to repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus. If you're here, and you don't need to talk to somebody because you know already. You just know you've been neglecting that moment. You're putting it off for better things on this earth. Then I would encourage you to use the space that we're given this morning to repent of your sins, to trust in Jesus right where you are, and to know today that you've settled with the judge. i give you a few moments of silent reflection And then I'll read the words of the Lord's Supper from Luke's Gospel together, and we'll take the elements.
Later in Luke's Gospel, he's going to record, or he does record, these words of the installation of the meal that we now know as the Lord's Supper, a picture of this baptism that he describes here in Luke 12. He took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, his followers, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you as the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of him. Our Father, we thank you that we who can eat that bread and drink uh, that juice can say that you have brought us to a point of decision that we have repented of our sins, and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as a result we stand uh, eternally justified, made right with you, that we have no fear in life or in death. Thank you that you, in your sovereign economy, brought us to a place of clarity and conviction where we would bow the knee to your authority in our lives. And we pray that that would inform Uh, the way that we make decisions, life in this world, and we pray for our friends here this morning who have not uh, made a decision uh, to repent and believe. We pray that as they experience the worship of those who have, that you would move in their hearts such that they would place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that for his sake. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing a final song uh, before we're dismissed?